Yeah, we'll, we'll start off with uh, you, Dave. How do you use Katsu um, for recovery, both with your water polo players and your swimmers? Uh, so for, for water polo, um, one of the things that we have are the aqua bands. And with the aqua bands, as soon as a game is over, uh, the girls put the leg aqua bands on, they hop in the water immediately, and they do a flutter kick for about 20 seconds to build the lactic acid back up in the muscles and get the blood um, engorged in the legs. And uh, then they do a 25 uh, flutter kick with the skull. Uh, sometimes they'll push off of the wall after the flutter kick, they'll push off of the wall and they'll put their hands up and they'll egg beater. Um, and then they'll come back to the wall and flutter kick. So um, they'll do something to get the blood engorged in their legs. And then um, they will do maybe one lap or two laps, hop out, pull off the um, katsus, and uh, they tell me they can feel relief. I think uh, the word that they use is refreshed. It feels refreshing. Um, and this is completely different from what I see water polo players traditionally do after a water polo game. The game is more or less 45 minutes to an hour if it goes into overtime. The athletes typically go to the warm down pool and just basically swim easy. Whereas you've completely um, changed this form of recovery, correct? Yes, um, after learning a lot about how katsu works and how especially learning how when the blood is engorged in the legs, how the veins and the arteries stretch, the capillaries stretch, and all the blood is engorged in all three of them. And so with the capillaries completely full, uh, when you release the uh, aqua bands, those capillaries are vital in pulling out the lactic acid. And so I think you explained what I was doing was when you pull the aqua bands off, it's like a dam opening up and the lactic acid just flushing out. Yes, yes. And Chris, how do you use it with your athletes, uh, both in uh, competition and, and, and workouts in terms of so, recovery? Yes, it's very similar to, to, to Dave. Um, we use both the aqua bands and the pneumatic bands for the recovery. Uh, I think at, at this, if we want to talk about practice uh, or in training sessions, we just because there seems to be a little more time and there's the fact of getting out and drying off so that, you know, with the pneumatic bands that don't go, uh, that are not made for the water, we have a little more time to, to just use the cycle feature. Um, it, it's, it's very interesting how I usually ask the swimmers, do you want to do your arms or your legs? And usually the response is, kind of very related to what kind of athlete they are. If they're more of an arm dominant swimmer, they tend to want to recover their arms. If they're a leg dominant swimmer, they want to recover their legs. Uh, I've, I found it, there's, I don't think there's a formula as much as it's more just for the mental side also, if they want to feel like their legs are recovered, well, it, they actually will recover their legs, but they like that feel. So it's kind of like an athlete, if they want to have their mas a massage of their legs or their arms or their upper back. So. We'll use the pneumatic uh, bands in, in the training sort of environment. Um, and we'll do three, three, maybe sometimes even four full cycles with the cycle 2.0. So it can last anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes. Um, and yeah, just using the cycle. So they sit, they'll usually sit, whether it's in a chair or um, where, where the team area is and they'll just cycle through. And, and really the response is, is 90, 99% of the time, they feel m much more recovered than just a traditional swimming down or cooling down. Um, we, we still do use uh, warming down in the classical sense. At a swim meet, what we'll do is, just similar to Dave, is we'll use the katsu bands, arms or legs, and recover. Um, again, much like Dave, we'll, we'll do some higher intensity swimming, so it's not just easy swimming. They'll swim at a moderate pace. I'll give them a set, you know, and if they have the, the armbands on, we'll do, we won't necessarily pull, but they'll do a more of an upper body focused warm down 
Uh, if, if they're using the leg bands, just like Dave, you know, we'll do some vertical kicking or kind of a kick swim progression where they go from a moderate pace to an easy pace. They'll take the bands off and then finish with, you know, just an easy hundred with no, no katsu bands on. Great. And Dave, you, you also coach the uh, high school uh, swimmers. And yes. Before we had this Corona uh, virus lockdown, you were experimenting with the dual meets where kids will swim four events in, in the space of two hours. And I yes. thought what you were doing was really innovative. So I wanted to wait for Chris to speak on swimming because he's been using Katsu um, with, with swim for eight years. And this is my first swim season using Katsu um, for, for the warm down. So I wanted to wait for him to uh, speak on how he uses it for swimming. Um, so unfortunately, um, we were only able to use these at two meets. Uh, the feedback I got from the, uh, the athletes was um, very positive. And so um, our, first, our first two swim meets were against Long Beach Poly and Long Beach Wilson. And at Long Beach Poly, I brought the aqua bands and some of the water polo girls were using them. And I remember after the medley relay, uh, one of the varsity water polo players, one of only three varsity water polo players on the 19 uh, person varsity swim team, a girl swim team, was using them uh, in a similar way after her 50 freestyle in the medley relay. She was doing a flutter kick, a flutter kick, and then she'd be golf kick into a, a flutter kick with a skull. I think she did another one at the other end and then came back and then got out and took the bands off. Um, and some of the club swimmers saw her doing that. And one of them was asking me, you know, what she, what, what she was doing. And I said that, you know, it's a, it's a different way of warming down. And, um, you know, you should, you should try it and see what you think. And so I forget if she swam at 200 free or 200 IM. And after she was done, she tried it out with the flutter kick, um, hard flutter kick uh, against the wall with the leg bands on. And then she did, uh, I think, you know, maybe a couple more laps and then she took them off. And then she, as a club swimmer, I think she swam a little bit more and she came out and uh, the rest of the club swimmers who'd never done this. They've, they've been using it for strength and conditioning training with, in the weight room with us. I had never used it for a warm down. Um, she said her, her, she felt really good. Like she was ready to race again and that her legs normally would feel kind of, I forget the word she used, but jiggly or something like that. And they feel good. And so the rest of the girls were using them, or not the rest, a number of girls tried it. And then the Wilson meet was the next week and I didn't, and, and they used the, uh, the leg bands to warm down. And uh, you had brought a couple and then I brought my pneumatic bands for the arms. So after they do the leg warm down, they would come over and get their splits and they would put the pneumatic ones on for two or three cycles. And um, the ones that wanted to use it and then they would, uh, and then they would leave. Um, the feedback I got was very positive from all the club swimmers. And these are club swimmers that swim different clubs. It's not just one club. And they really liked it. So when we got to the Wilson meet, uh, I, I believe every one of the varsity swimmers was using the aqua bands to warm down. Uh, and we didn't have enough of the pneumatic bands. So I know the top swimmers were coming over and they were kind of like lining up to use the uh, pneumatic bands. Um, because it's, you know, we only had three of them, but very positive that, you know, the athletes are the ones that say that they really liked it. Yeah. So it basically took you two dual meets to go from what is it to complete adoption? Not only what was it, a couple of the girls were kind of like, you know, I, that's not the proper way to warm down. And I said, well, you, you can tr try it. You know, you, the worst that can happen is you try it and then you, and then you do your warm down after, yeah. you know? Yeah. And Chris, what do you explain to your swimmers? Um, many of whom go on to swim at NCAA division one schools. How do you explain to a young teenage athlete or a, a, you know, a collegiate athlete, what you're doing with Katsu to recovery? Yeah, that. That's a great question. And, and my answers are usually based on how I can try to convince them that it's the right thing, whether they're, you know, very, uh, I don't want to say skeptical, but uh, doubtful or, or they're all in, um, you know, the all in kids are, and it's 
starting to be more all in kids because the we, we're, we're having a lot of result and all of our kids that use katsu for recovery and for training are having good results so it's getting easier to to convince them um but i i think the way i i tell them is just like dave again you know it's different it's a different way to warm down but what i think and actually as we're having this discussion right now i'm kind of my mind is going and i'm thinking you know it's a it's a way to to prime your body for the next, what's coming next. So if you, if you are recovering, I think already the brain is, is telling the, the, the nervous system, right, we're recovering. So I think the katsu is a catalyst to help prime for the recovery. If it's to warm up, because I also use them to warm up, the body is using the, the katsu as a, a primer for warming up. So I think that's really what you're doing. Um, you know, I think that what the katsu does is it helps the body sort of fast forward the recovery or fast forward the, the, the warming down. I don't know if Dave would agree with that, but it, what it does is we really, we have such little time, such little space. So for me, it's the perfect tool to help for this recovery warm down or, or, or even warm up. It really, we have such, and here in New England where the, warm down in some pools we don't have warm down so i've done some experimenting just to share and i apologize if i keep talking is i've had situations where my top athletes uh, talking about I, I have a young man who's going to nc state the top recruit next year a sprinter we've been in meets where we don't have warm down there is no warm down it's a six lane pool so we warm down with just you know and using the pneumatic belts, I'll even rather than just sitting, I'll have him do simulated land swimming or walking with the cycles on. And they, he, we actually did an experiment where purposefully he, he one time did have a little bit of a warm down option, but we didn't warm down. Instead, we just did katsu. And he, his results were just as fine as they always were with warming down. So for him, he's like, well, I'm not warming down anymore. I'm just going to use katsu. Yeah. So... And I'm fine with that because I know physiologically he is, you know, like, and we've had, you know, Michael Andrew is one of our great examples of using katsu cycles between world championship events and, and had success. So, yeah, I want to shift a little bit between recovery from an athletic competition to actually recovery from injuries. And both of you, uh, in Dave's case, he had some lower back issues, um, he had some uh, issues in his mouth. And Chris, you had a broken heel and broken ribs. Dave, can you explain how you felt uh, COTS helped you with both your back and your, your mouth? Yeah, so r really the first thing was uh, that I noticed uh, healing was, was my back. So in 2015, I, was, I got T-boned. In, in a, in a, uh, I was in an automobile accident. I got T-boned. And... Um, I've been going to the chiropractor, you know, three days a week. Um, I was on a constant cycle with my doctor. It was like a regular phone call every three months. Uh, going to the doctor, I was getting uh, ne neoproxen, a um, muscle relaxers, and Vicodin. Um, and I tried not to take the Vicodin as much, but I was constantly with the with the with the painkillers, um, three days a week, going to the chiropractor just to be able to, you know, move and walk. Um, some days I was, you know, I'd go for weeks where I was probably okay, feeling pretty good, you know, three weeks. And then all of a sudden I'd wake up, I couldn't move my back. You know, I couldn't walk. It killed. I had a, sometimes I was on crutches and this has been a constant since 2000, late 2015. And, uh, I started using the Katsu cycles and I was really using it to work out. And I was going to the gym seven days a week in the summertime when I started using it. And, um, you asked me to cut back the gym. And what happened was little by little, uh, my back started to feel like I wasn't having any episodes anymore where, where I couldn't walk. Um, and then, you know, I stopped calling my doctor to ask for a refill for, uh, you know, the painkillers. And then I started going to the chiropractor maybe twice a month. And I stopped going in December and uh, he's, he's going to eventually, my chiropractor, I love him. He's going to see this and he's going to go, he's, he texted me the other day. Like, where have you been? I haven't seen you. Like, what's your deal? Like, come in. 
Um, but I haven't been to the chiropractor since December and my back has felt great. I haven't had a single episode and I haven't had to um, take any painkillers or anything for it. It was just, uh, um, I have to be honest, it, it didn't happen overnight and it didn't happen within one week where it just went from really bad to, 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 to nothing. But I, I was using it constantly. I want to say that after like a month, two months, um, you could tell a huge difference. And then, you know, I think it was three, four, five months. I, I'm not going to the chiropractor anymore. Wow. And, and you're not seeing the doctor anymore either. I haven't since wow. I've, since I've, since I started the Katsu, I haven't gone into the doctor for my back and, um, she's probably wondering when she's going to get the phone call. Yeah. And what was the issue with your mouth? So since I was 24 years old, I don't know why, but, um, when I go to the dentist, they have to do something with a laser because they say that my gums are inflamed. And so, you know, even with the copay, you know, teachers, we have a pretty good insurance uh, plan. And so we've got a pretty good copay, but it's just every time I go in, I'm spending 300 or 600 or $700 out of pocket. I don't know how much it would cost, you know, completely out of pocket uh, to have them clean up my gums using lasers because they're inflamed and they are swelling. And so when this COVID-19 thing um, epidemic happened, um, I had time and it, it had been, I put off going to the dentist for two years because I was just like, man, every time I go in there, I've got to do this gum thing. So I made a phone call to my dentist and they said, I said, when can I, do you have anything open? And it usually takes a few weeks. And they said, we have an opening today because everybody's canceling. Um, so I went in that day. Uh, we did the x-rays, they did the cleaning. And then I'm, I'm just bracing for like a $1,200 laser, laser uh, surgery, whatever they're doing with my gums with the lasers. And um, she says, hey, your gums are fine. Wow. And I said, you, my, my gums are fine. So you just need, you're going to need to like, you don't need to use the laser this time. Your, your gums are fine. And wow. I went, Wow. So that's when I got in the, I got in the uh, car and I called you and I went, this is, this is bizarre. Um, is, is this, does this have, this has to be a Katsu, I'm guessing. Katsu has something to do with it. And you explained to me how many capillaries we have in our mouth and everything. And I says, wow, you never explained this to me. And you're, you said right away, well, you never told me you had a problem with your gums. Uh, yeah. And Chris, that, that's an unbelievable story. Chris, you had a, you had an aha moment yourself. When you were doing right. a tough yeah. mutter, right. first first uh, talk about your tough mutter accident. So, uh, and then was in um, just as I was sort of experienced the midlife crisis and that needed to challenge myself, I'd signed up for a tough mutter uh, up in New Hampshire, and uh, was was pretty uh, feeling good about uh, my fitness level that I trained a little bit for it, and on the very last obstacle. Uh, it was sort of climbing over a log. I, I lost my balance and I slipped and fell onto the log right on my, on my, on my side. Um, I had only ever broken a bone one previous time when I lived in Switzerland doing something stupid. And so I, I knew what a broken rib felt like. Um, and so I immediately told myself, wow, I, I think I broke my rib. And I, I told my wife uh, that I broke it. And when you finish a, a Tough Mudder, the, the celebration is they give you a beer. And, and so I actually, I, I took the beer more for the, to try to cut the pain down a little bit. And uh, that was on a Saturday. Um, Sunday, I, I was in pain, I knew. And on Monday morning, I took myself to Mass General and, and just, I, I knew I needed an x-ray just to confirm. I knew that there's nothing really you can do for a broken rib other than, you know, the knowledge that you, you can that you have a broken rib and so got the x-ray and lo and behold i not only had a broken rib i had two broken ribs one was a was pretty good fracture the other one was a hairline fracture so it was kind of a a break and a half as i tell people um so that afternoon i just started doing katsu and and told Stephen i can't i can't do it today and a, another gentleman uh who who trained me, a japanese uh ek, katsu master mr shimizu told me, well, I need to do katsu more. And I was still very new to it and didn't 
you know, I was like, well, it's my rib. I can't put the belts around my rib. I was still learning that it's not about the position of the bands, but it's about how much you do katsu. So I started doing katsu about four times a day. Uh, fast forward eight days later, I was feeling great. I was very surprised at how, how, how the pain had gone down and I felt a little more mobile. And again, I was doing a, multiple, multiple sessions of just katsu cycles with the first generation uh, machine, Steve remembers. And uh, so it was a little bit not as easy to do cycles. It's like button on, button on, you know, it wasn't as easy as just the cycle 2.0 now. Uh, I went into the Harvard training room and managed to convince somebody to do an x-ray. And the, the doctor who looked at my x-ray said, you know, well, you, you, you must have broken a, a rib you know, several months ago. We see it, but it couldn't have been last week. So I didn't even tell him because I didn't want to get anyone in trouble for doing the x-ray. Uh, that's all I needed. So that was my first aha moment. And then should I share the second yes. one? Yes, please. Very Wait, I have a question. Yeah. So you, you broke the rib um, a, a week before and the katsu uh, made it, it like it, it helped your body to heal it as fast or faster than if you would have broken it a couple months prior, correct? Correct. Yeah. So I just, I healed, the bone healed very quickly. Um, and I wasn't doing nothing, no, just cycles, just a lot of, you know, so the, the body's response to the, you know, increased number of, of katsu, katsu cycles, my, my, my body's response was bone growth. Um, and, you know, I unfortunately don't know all the technical terms for bone growth, but the, the, the intense katsu cycles helped the bone growth and, and, you know, with, whatever other healing factors um, helped reduce the pain as well. Yeah, and then you, you had another incident that you hadn't yeah, expected so, and so, with even more dramatic improvement. Yeah, a little more dramatic and, and um, Dave will appreciate this. We, uh, you know, here in, in New England, we don't have the keys to the pool. So I was locked out of a pool on a Saturday morning and I did know how to enter the facility. Um, I won't get my, well, I don't, work at that pool anymore so it doesn't matter but I knew how to get into the pool but it it required climbing over a wall in pitch dark so it was an indoor pool we I, I took a, another swimmer with me to hold a cell phone light so as I climbed over the wall and the only light I had I could barely see because you know I'm I'm old so my vision isn't very good and as I dropped down I landed on my heel um, but I misjudged the landing so it really I, I had terrible shoes on um, you know, it wasn't flip-flops, it was just skater vans, right? So the cushioning wasn't very good. And I landed on my left heel and took all the impact on one, one foot. Um, I knew right away that I was in trouble. Um, I managed to hop, hobble over to get the lights on and go open the door. And I sat down and all my team, they knew right away that I was in pain. I, I tried to hide it, but they knew that I was, uh, I had an assistant coach there. I drove myself immediately, the, the coach took over the workout. I drove myself immediately to the to their urgent care up where I live, up in Danvers, and um, you know they X-rayed it, and lo and behold, I fractured the calcaneus bone, which is a bone that um, you know Stephen knows as well. Is there's a lot of uh, vasculature, you know, a lot of capillaries around that bone, but it when you break it, uh, um, uh, the doctor said you, you you either did something really stupid or you took a sledgehammer to your own foot. And I said, well, it was A, um, I did something really stupid. So again, katsu, 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 lots of lots of cycles. And I, I, they did give me a boot and crutches and it was literally 10 days. Um, they said it uh, would excuse be- Excuse me, what was the prognosis when, what would the doctor predict that would happen? Uh, that I would be probably six weeks to three months in a boot and uh, crutches and I, I was, off the crutches within a, a week. I didn't even need them. And I took the boot off after 10 days. And, uh, you know, I had some sensitivity for probably the same amount of time that they said, but I was walking and, and, and even running um, within, within, I don't know, within two weeks, I was, I was walking out of the boot. I did have some sensitivity, but it was very interesting because when I would do the cut, <laughs> cycles on my legs it took 
the sensitivity, I almost took it away. It actually made it, it made it feel a lot better just to have that blood flow to that, you know, and I really, I was pretty uh, extreme on how, how often I did the katsu cycles on my legs. So that I, I, I don't need any more aha moments. Yeah, that's great, especially for a swim coach. You're just walking up and down the pool deck or a yeah. water pool and swim coach. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. I mean, you know, we're just sort of giving people a hint as to what are the um, uh, practical uses of katsu and, and uh, from Dave's uh, water polo team that really radicalizes um, uh, warming down to Chris, what you do with your swimmers, many of them who are elite. This has been very, very interesting. Did you want to leave any last messages or have any more stories, either of you? Uh, I think I, I'll just say real quick is, uh, you know, I think uh, I, I want to take this moment too to say, you know, I think with Dave and I talking to each other, you know, I think that the relationship between swimming and water polo has always been sometimes been considered tense, but I think when you have open-minded people like us, um, you know, and I'm even wearing the shirt, right? As a swim coach, I'm a big believer in the sport of water polo. So totally unrelated to katsu, but just want to give that, give water polo a shout out. Uh, thank you. And, and Dave? Yeah. Oh, no. And I really appreciate, uh, you know, Chris, uh, you know, before talking to a couple of club swim coaches, uh, you know, I was able to call Chris up and, and, um, touch base with him and pick his brain on, and because he's been doing, you know, this for, for eight years with, with, with uh, swimmers and, and has had, uh, you know, great results, you know, the results speak for themselves. And so uh, it's just really nice to um, have another coach out there that uses Katsu and we have the, um, we've had the same experiences personally with it. So it's not something that we're guessing works. Um, we've both felt it with our own bodies. Um, and even something as simple as I told you a few weeks ago, I mean, it's a small injury after hearing Chris's, this is going to sound kind of weak, but you know, I had mentioned that, um, I sliced my thumb really bad to where it needed to get stitches. And I told you that, um, I figured if I have to go to the emergency room to get stitches now, I'm going to have to go in two hours from now. My, let me just try Katsu. So I wrapped it tight, put the hydrogen peroxide on it. And I did, I did a couple hours of Katsu and I took, took it off and I was like, now it's borderline. So then I did it again, woke up the next morning and I looked at it and then it was just a bad cut. And then I did it. And by the end of the day, I mean, it healed like it was healed. And I have a scar from it. I mean, you know, if I would have got stitches, there'd be no scar, but I mean, you know, it's on my thumb. Um, but, but just something as simple as it, you know, your cuts, they, they, your body heals so much faster with something as simple as a cut. If you just start doing these katsu cycles, um, and then just having another coach like Chris that I can just, you know, call up and, and say, how are you using this with your swimmers? Um, I was thinking of doing this. Um, what is, have you done anything like this? Yes, uh, but I do it like this. And so just having another Katsu uh, user, a big time Katsu user that has a lot of uh, experience in it, and, um, it's, it's, it's awesome being able to um, pick up the phone and have that resource. Yeah, great. And Chris, I noticed um, you have your certificate uh, from Dr. Sato, the Katsu inventor over your shoulder. Yeah. It's very cool. Well, and I have it, you know, I, I should probably put it above, but I have it, you know, below my college diploma. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's, it's, I, it reminds me, you know, I, I can't read it. It's in Japanese. Steve <laughs> can read it. But uh, yeah, I guess... Um, yeah, I'm very proud of it. And, and, and I, I, I passed the test because uh, Stephen was there the day in Tokyo when I had to go through the gauntlet of Dr. Sato on his Stairmaster from, I don't know, 1970. And, and Dr. Sato putting the katsu bands on you is like nothing else. So it was like a vice grip on my legs. And it was, uh, I'll never regret it, but I don't know if I ever want to do that again because that was the worst Stairmaster 20 minutes I've ever done. It was brutal. Yeah. And Dave will have an experience of meeting uh, Dr. Sato uh, at the rescheduled Tokyo Olympics. Uh, yeah. Both of you will be there. We'll be um, demonstrating, explaining Katsu to the Olympic family. And so it'll be a good time for us to get together in Tokyo. Looking forward, yeah. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. You know, good luck on your seasons and kick some butt.